There are so many elements of the original series that, through pop culture, have become common knowledge to even the general public. Things like the Mirror Universe and Spock's beard, or Brain is Brain, What is Brain? And this episode, The Savage Curtain, would propel Space Abraham Lincoln right up there among the greats. Hello and welcome to Backtrack, a web series that focuses on the background information of any given topic in Star Trek. In this episode, we're taking a look at the Star Trek The Original Series episode, The Savage Curtain, to better understand its place in Star Trek history. When I sit down and begin the process of researching an episode for Backtrack, the first two questions I ask myself are, what's next? Referring, of course, to what episode I might want to research, and the dreaded question as to why I want to research that episode. Although the intent is to eventually make a video on every Star Trek episode ever created, truth be told, I have to be inspired to make a video on a particular outing in the Star Trek universe. Mix in my current commitment of rediscovering Season 3 of Star Trek The Original Series, and you may begin to see the problem I am facing. First, Season 3, as I'm sure you all know, is universally hailed by fandom as the worst of the original series. A combination of Gene Roddenberry leaving, a budget decrease, salary increases, and Harlan Ellison's influencing writers to stay away from Star Trek, all played a major part in the decreased production values of this season. So when I'm looking at a list of episodes to make, suddenly my eyes glaze over and I'll stare blankly not really knowing where to go next. Sure, there are good and even great episodes in Season 3, but it's very easy to lump everything together and say it's a horrible season and ignore it completely. So how do I decide what to do next? Well, simple. I pick an episode, and if something in about 10 minutes of preliminary research catches my eye, then it gets made. If not, it just goes on the eventually to-do list. But this episode was a bit different. Why? Well, because of Gene Roddenberry. The Savage Curtain was one of only two stories written by Gene for the third season, the other being Turnabout Intruder both episodes existing at practically the end of the show's run. No one, production crew and staff or actors, were very impressed with Gene Roddenberry during Season 3. Gene's commitment to the series had started off strong, promising one and all that he would personally make Season 3 the best of all. But when NBC changed Star Trek's time slot to one which ensured its death, Gene would valiantly put up his own involvement in the show on the line unless Trek's original time slot was reinstated. But NBC would not relent, and Gene would almost completely withdraw from the series, spending most of his time with his longtime mistress, Majel Barrett. However, the type of things that had affected everyone's view of Gene was not his withdrawal from the show, Rather, the times he actually included himself in it. Whenever Gene did show up on set, it would often be to deliver a page or two of rewritten dialogue to be filmed for that particular episode, and usually the dialogue would be something to further Gene's agenda, that being either to make him some fast cash, i.e. the inclusion of the Idic pin, so he could sell it in a mail-order catalogue, or some other type of dialogue to further one of Gene's views as a sort of revenge on NBC or someone or some group he didn't like. So when I discovered that The Savage Curtain and Turnabout Intruder, both infamous episodes in their own right for various different reasons, were in fact written by Gene, I knew I had to take a look into these episodes right away. The idea for this episode was actually seeded way back in 1964 in Gene's proposal for the original series. Titled Mr. Socrates, Gene wanted to further sweeten the Star Trek pot to the network and show that in fact he was intending to make a show as action-packed as possible. So the original short blurb for the episode would see Kirk and Spock fighting vicious historical villains, something which again appealed to the network 
And while he was writing a memo on Gene Kuhn's script for Spectre of the Gun, he was reminded of the idea and decided to write the episode as a revenge tactic against NBC. Roddenberry's original story featured Socrates visiting the Enterprise along with Abraham Lincoln, and then having our intrepid heroes being forced to participate in a fight by alien beings on their homeworld. This version would in fact include Surak, though he was called Lavav, and the good team also featured the recreation of a 1970s flower power guru named Pan. The evil team would consist of Mr. Green, a late 20th century Earth dictator, also Adolf Hitler, of course from World War II, and Attila the Hun, among other less important baddies from history. Gene intended for this episode to be a commentary on present day, his present of course, network television, again having been soured by NBC not conceding to his demands for season 3. In Gene's eyes, the Excalbians represented the network, and how the network didn't care about people, rather creating these staged dramas for their own amusement, regardless of the personal cost on the individual. And that the network, sorry the Excalbians, were using these dramas to slowly brainwash their whole population, and eventually became dependent on these staged plays as their sole means of gaining any knowledge. Gene certainly had an axe to grind. And to the powers that be, reading his intended story, that much was clear. What was also clear is that, as written, there was no way this episode would ever see the light of day, and so Arthur Heinemann would be brought in for an extensive rewrite of the entire episode. Faced with the daunting task, Heinemann decided to pull out all the elements of the script that he liked, minus their connotations, and then rewrite the episode around those elements. He would act Socrates in favor of focusing on Lincoln. He would keep Lavav, but rename him Surek, better keeping with established Vulcan traditions. He would get rid of Pan and his flower power, and also he would get rid of Hitler, feeling the Nazi leader was too much of a hot-button issue for the time. He'd change Mr. Green to Colonel Green, and flesh out his backstory more, and add a Klingon character which would become a staple in Star Trek, that of Kalis the Unforgettable. He'd also add a female villain named Zora, and Genghis Khan. But in order to save money for the episode, these two characters would not have a single line, allowing Star Trek to pay them as extras rather than guest stars. A little bit of Trek trivia for you all here is in regards to the Excalbians, who inform Kirk and Spock of the plot of the episode. Even though no name was given to the character in the episode proper, he was indeed actually named, as the script refers to the Excalbian as Yarnak. Reading Heinemann's rewrite, the powers that be were quite happy, but realized in order for this episode to work, a strong actor to play a believable Abraham Lincoln was needed, and so they immediately commissioned Mark Leonard for the role. That's right, the actor that played Spock's father Sarek and the Romulan commander from Balance of Terror was originally chosen to fill this role as well. However, due to prior commitments, Mark Leonard would not be available. He explains, I was doing a series at the time called Here Comes the Brides, in which I played Aaron Stemple, the resident bad guy, rich guy. The Lincoln segment came up at about Christmas time when we had a slight hiatus, and I thought I could work it in. I had already played two roles on Star Trek, and they were well received, but it turned out we just couldn't work it in. I think we went back to work on the other series too soon, and instead of having the six or seven days I would need to do the role, I only had three or four. And so Lee Berger was brought in for the iconic role. Lee would have an extensive acting career, though mostly as a guest star and in minor roles, though he would have a two-year stint on Dynasty playing Joseph Anders from 1981 to 1983. Personally, I think Lee brought great justice to the role of Lincoln. His gravitas and portrayal of the historic figure is so well done that in my mind, when I hear the name Lincoln, it's his picture that pops into it first. 
I'd even venture to say that the pop culture love for Space Lincoln comes directly from his excellent acting in the role. Lee passed away on January 31, 2007, from undisclosed causes while at a nursing and rehabilitation facility in Fremont, New Hampshire. He was 88 years old. Garrett Barry Atwater would beam into the episode to play Surak, probably the most significant historical figure for the Vulcan people, in universe of course, as Surak would be considered the father of Vulcan philosophy. Again, an excellent actor whose portrayal of Surik simply added to the episode. Atwater also had an extensive acting career, though for me, aside from this episode, I will always remember him from the Twilight Zone episode The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. A little bit more Trek trivia for you all here is in regards to Surik and the Vulcan salute. Atwater himself had a great deal of difficulty making the famous gesture, and so what he had to do was keep his hands at his sides, pushing his fingers against his body to get them in the proper position before he could raise them for all the audience to see. Atwater died from a stroke while he suffered from cancer on May 24, 1978, shortly after his 60th birthday. After the episode aired, NBC was flooded with letters from fans who were fascinated by Surak. They were itching to know more about this Vulcan and the history of the Vulcan people and demanded to see more of him. And although ideas for a fourth season episode dealing with Vulcan's history before finding out the series was cancelled, Surik would not be seen again until over 35 years later in the Star Trek Enterprise episode Awakening. Equally as important as this episode's good guys were of course the bad guys. Philip Pine would take up the mantle of the infamous Colonel Green. Like most actors on Trek at the time, Pine also had an extensive acting career, though again for me, I remember him from the Twilight Zone episode, The Four of Us Are Dying. Philip Pine died on December 22, 2006 of an undisclosed illness. Though not playing a large role in the episode, Kalis the Unforgettable would become a major part of Star Trek in its future, living up to his namesake. Robert Heron would play the Klingon hero, and Heron was actually a stuntman for the original series, going all the way back to the pilot as Jeffrey Hunter's stunt double. He also played Sam in the season 1 episode Charlie X. He actually has 342 credits as a stuntman, and 64 credits as an actor though most of those are as various minor roles. Heron is still alive and well, though at the ripe old age of 96. I doubt he'll be doing many more stunts. Finally, Herschel Dougherty would direct this episode. He only directed two episodes of Star Trek, the other being the season one finale Operation Annihilate. He directed over 80 other projects though throughout his history, and died on March 5, 1993, at the age of 82. Reception for the episode overall was lackluster at the time, though as previously alluded to, there were elements that were truly intriguing to fandom, and as a result would end up driving Star Trek in the future into making them well-established and fleshed-out parts of its own mythos. Leonard Nimoy, however, did not like this episode at all. He says, that episode didn't work very well, as I recall. It was an interesting attempt that did not really come to life like four score and seven years ago. Thanks to pop culture, however, the Savage Curtain would gain in popularity as time went on, fandom itself seeing it as a cornerstone of sorts for many Star Trek concepts, many other shows and parodies highlighting Abraham Lincoln, sitting in a chair, traveling through the recesses of deep space. And that alone has most definitely earned this episode its place in Star Trek history. John. Captain Kirk, I believe. Alert status. Do I gather that you recognize me? I am Abraham Lincoln. Just as I am whom I appear to be. Seraph. The greatest of all who ever lived on our planet, Captain. 
Commonly, as you may know through history, Colonel Green, who led a genocidal war, Zora, Genghis Khan, Kalis. Zora, no need to blame yourself. We have a complete power failure. What happened? The shielding is breaking down, and I estimate four hours before the ship blows up. To save your ship and your crew, you have to win. Oh! Captain, how can we warn him? Your existence is ended. Thank you for watching today's episode of Backtrack. What do you think of the Savage Curtain? Does this version of Lincoln pop into your head when you hear the former president's name? Well, leave your comments in the section below, and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel fight the greatest historical villains? Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, live long, and prosper.